Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines Magazine podcast. I'm Kwangu Liwewe, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. After widespread protests led to the overthrow of Omar al-Bashir in 2019, Sudan seemed to be on track towards civilian rule. But in 2021, the country's brief respite from military dictatorship was ended by a coup launched by Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and the ambitious General Mohammed Hamdan Tagalo, nicknamed Hemeti. It was never an uncomplicated partnership. Since becoming leader of the Rapid Support Forces, Hemeti had been able to operate outside the army's command structure. He leveraged his position to amass wealth, power, and influence, taking control of Sudan's gold mines in 2017 and building his own network of patrons abroad. Earlier this month, the tensions between them boiled over. Intense fighting broke out between the army and the RSF and the violence shows little signs of abating. With mounting civilian casualties, hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to flee the fighting amid fears it could be the beginning of a new civil war. First, we'll hear from Dalia Abdomanin, a former journalist and activist from the Sudan capital Khartoum, who we spoke to in 2021 after the October military coup that brought Burhan and Dagalo to power. She spoke to us from Port Sudan on the Red Sea, where she and her family had evacuated to after escaping Khartoum. The evacuation from Khartoum was uh, an experience I don't think I've ever been through in my life. I mean, I think once it became clear that the fighting was going to escalate more and more, especially once the evacuation of foreign nationals started, A lot of us, a lot of Sudanese realized that this is the best time to evacuate from the capital. So the majority opted for the Egyptian border, simply because of the familiarity with Egypt, the language and so on. But uh, we decided as a family to go towards Port Sudan because it's it's a port and there's more, we have more options. You can go to the UAE or Djibouti or Saudi or even Egypt. And the number of people heading towards Port Sudan at the time were not was not that high. Uh, so we were basically looking for buses, coaches to take us. But the demand was for Egypt. It wasn't for Port Sudan. And then when we finally found someone and we agreed on the price and everything, they didn't show up the next day. And it was also the day when the, there was an internet blackout and mobile network connectivity was down. So we literally scrambled around people who had mobile they could call they were we were just calling every single contact we had on our phone and miraculously we somehow ended up all being together on the same bus even though we took the decision that we would give priority to the elderly and those with young kids and then the next batch would be those with like teenage kids and then the last batch would be those who and like me you know single they don't have dependents and so on so we ended up being all together, 29 family members together, and we took a 26-hour journey from Khartoum all the way to Port Sudan, going through something like five different cities and towns until we made it. So just describe for us, you said it took you about 26 hours to get to Port um, Sudan. Now, we've been hearing harrowing stories about you know the RSF raiding people's homes, freeing prisoners, and just committing various atrocities. Um, Can you shed more light on this for us? We were lucky that the route the bus driver took was the safest. It was the longest, but it was the safest because he went through army controlled areas. So we didn't run into any RSF soldiers, but we did hear really harrowing stories of buses being stopped, passengers ordered to like relinquish their money, their valuables you know, so, but we didn't experience that. So in that sense, we were very, very, very fortunate. But it was still a risk because the infrastructure of Sudan has not been developed by the previous regime. So we're going on very rocky roads and Eastern Sudan is quite a mountainous area. So we're going up and down these really narrow highways, supposedly, you know, some of them not paved. And, you know, it's just, it's it's a risk. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, especially in a situation like with Sudan, which is very much in fluid. Every day there's something happening, something is changing. So, But it's always a risk. It's a risk to stay. It's a risk to leave. And it's just you just have to decide which one you want to you wanna go for, and you just go for it. 
So like your family and other families, I know tens of thousands are now fleeing Sudan. Can you tell us firsthand what is happening at the borders and at the ferries? Sudan is surrounded by eight other countries and people are trying to get to these countries. What are you hearing? Uh, the most problematic border is the one with Egypt. Uh, like I said, the language, the culture, the familiarity, that it's also a fellow Arab country. So a lot of people are heading towards there and... I don't think the border posts are ready. For, you know, they've never been ready to accept such a sheer large number of people. I mean, I was talking to a, re- a cousin of mine, and he's like, we just arrived, and there's already 40 buses ahead of us. And each bus, let's say, on average has 50 passengers. And then another person who had an agent who was working, you know, getting all the buses, in one day, he had something like between 40 to 50 buses going through. That's just one agent or one travel tour operator. So the number, the sheer numbers are huge. And no one knows exactly what the requirements are. One minute they tell you they make exemptions for boys under the age of 55, that they won't need a visa. And then you hear no, they haven't allowed them in. And there's no facilities, there's loads of elderly people, you know, people who are sick or, you know, you know, they need medical care. And once you get to the border of Egypt, it's a long, tedious wait. I know people who've been waiting for their passports to be processed for more than three days. I've heard of two confirmed deaths at the border with Egypt. One woman died because she couldn't get insulin. The ambulance arrived seven seven hours after it was called. So it's just horror stories. There is no, no one has anything good to say about the crossing into Egypt. No one. And it's really, really shocking as to, I'm not putting the blame on the Egyptian government and because I know it's a sudden situation. And, and like I said, it's very few people crossing to Egypt through, road, through you know, over land. Most, of, most times it's usually by plane, by air. So, but at the same time, this conflict erupted. People are escaping. It's it's erupted in the capital. It's not. It hasn't erupted in the peripheries. It's erupted in the capital. So automatically, you know, these people will be moving out, and Egypt is a natural destination. So, I think it's a mixture of being unprepared. It's a mixture of their of governments not being sure as to how to deal with this sheer influx of people coming into their borders. I, I think someone also told me that I think around 20,000 people fled into Chad from Darfur. And there are people even now attempting to get to South Sudan from Khartoum. The same thing as Ethiopia is an option. It's a, it's, it's a crossing into you know, another safe territory for the time being. Eritrea as well. So it's just one big chaotic mess and it's uh, it doesn't look like it's going to slow down or improve anytime soon. So who knows? With all that you've described of what's happening at the different borders, particularly with Egypt, we're also hearing reports that um, there seems to be a preference for the foreigners to be evacuated first. How are the Sudanese reacting to this? We know it. We knew it was going to happen. I mean, the fact that the first so-called ceasefire to actually like hold or stay in place was when the evacuation of the foreign nationals took place. It wasn't the previous ones, nor the ones afterwards. It's because they wanted to evacuate Americans and uh, Germans and the Europeans and so on and so forth. I mean, when you have something like the UN convoy being uh, led by RSF, you know, troops says it all really it's just we don't matter there's no one to help us we have no one helping us we're literally figuring it out on our on our own you know and there's a humanitarian crisis brewing no one's there to help or to guide or to do anything so we're just sitting there and you see all these military jets being flown in and these you know airports that no one's actually heard of being opened up you know, to evacuate people who just happen to hold a better or different passport to your own. And it's very, it's, I mean, it's a slap in the face every time I think about it. It's just show, it goes to show that there's, there's a hierarchy, you know, when it comes to nationalities or, or what passport you're holding. And in, in a lot of cases, you don't matter. 
you know, no one cares about what happens to you. I mean, no offense, but every question, most of the media, media, um, media that I've done, I've always been asked about the evacuation of foreigners and foreigners. And I'm like, well, no one's asking us how we're going to get out. What we do? How can I get out? Do I have the means to get out? It's very, it's a very expensive process to get yourself out of a crisis situation like we're in at the moment. And don't forget, a lot of us don't have access to our banks because of the conflict. A lot of us don't have access to cash to pay for this evacuation for the buses. A lot of us don't even have the means to get from A to B, let alone to get from A to C or D. So it's just a nightmare scenario and no one's lending a hand. Okay, it's interesting that you bring that up about the ordinary Sudanese um, not being given any indication of what to do in terms of finding some safety. Now, another vulnerable group are the asylum seekers and the refugees. Mm -hmm. um, Sudan houses about 1.1 million of these. Do you have any idea what's happening to them? I mean, uh, I, I think uh, my, I had family members yesterday going to try and see if they could board some of these Saudi ferries boats, ships to leave for, to leave Sudan via Jeddah. And they said there was a large contingent of Yemen, Yemenis and Syrians. And they were saying, well, there's war here and there's war back home. We might as well just go back home. So a lot of them are leaving. You know, if it's not safe for the civilian, for the, you know, the civilians of the, the country, how is it going to be safe for those who are, who ran away seeking, you know, a safe haven, but can't even find it. So they're literally caught between a rock and a hard place. Go back home where it's not safe. Stay here where it's not safe. Same, same. From what you've described, do you see um, an unprecedented humanitarian crisis unfolding in Sudan and in the region as well? I think there could be a huge spillover effect if something is not done to stem the current crisis because... You're like, like you mentioned, we border so many countries and people are just fleeing. They're just leaving. I mean, I don't think I have one family member left in Khartoum. We've all gone off in different directions, you know, but there's no one left. So there's a spillover effect. You know, let's say, let's say a million Sudanese cross into Egypt. Egypt is having an, a, a horrible economic crisis. How are they going to house them? Who's going to pay, you know, who's going to help them out? Can they even find jobs when even local Egyptians themselves can't find jobs? You know, living, you know, how can they survive? Who's going to, how, how, will, how will they be able to buy supplies or pay for rent when they can't even access their own accounts back home? Or if they go to Ethiopia, which is already, you know, caught up in its own, you know, civil, uh, civil strife, or go to Chad. It's just, it's a nightmare scenario. I think this part of Africa will be rocked and it's not going to be, it's, not, it's going to get ugly. There's so many issues, so many problems, and it just needs a small, like, match. So now we're in the midst of another ceasefire, the one that began on Tuesday, and this is the fourth, with none of the previous ceasefires actually holding. What seems to be the problem? Uh, I mean... I don't know what's going on behind closed doors. I don't know how they're getting both sides to initially agree to a ceasefire. But it can, it can always just be a rogue soldier or a rogue, you know, when something and something goes off, anything. It's a, it's a very volatile situation. And both sides, whether it's the army or the RSF, are determined, you know, to get the upper hand, to have control of the whole city, of the country, so to speak. So it's, it's a battle. It's a struggle between... You can call them, you know, struggle between two men who are determined or two entities who are determined to gain that upper hand. So I don't think the. It, I think it's a bit. It's a bit idealistic to think that the ceasefires would hold. I mean, no, we actually make fun of it. Every time they announce the ceasefire, we suddenly just laugh and say, OK, what number is this? Is number five? Is it number seven? Because we, we know it's not going to hold. It needs to take something bigger and something more su substantial for the two sides to like step back or, you know, for, for there, for there's something to be, you know, viable to hold on to. But so far, I mean, today I was asking friends in Khartoum, they're like, oh yeah, the clashes have started all over again. It means nothing. It's just, they don't, they don't believe in the idea of ceasefire because I think it's, it's reached a point where it's either me or him, so to speak.
It's either Hamiti or Burhan. And if you ask any Sudanese, they'll tell you, oh, I will be with the army. No paramilitary group is going to be, is going to rule us. So I think it's going to continue for a while until one is, I think, until the army is able to push out the RSF from Khartoum. Clearly, you've indicated that there appears to be no end in sight. So should the world pay more attention to intervene and end this crisis? The world should have paid attention to the Sudanese when they were saying after the coup of 2021 that you cannot deal with these two men. You cannot treat them as partners in the transition to a civilian government because they're not partners. But no one listened to us. We were told, you, we were literally told, we know better than you. You know, take a step back. And, but we kept harping on, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. We all knew it was going to happen, but I think the speed at how, at, at, at how it took place took us all by surprise, but not a complete shock, a minor surprise, let's put it that way. So the international community, I think it's, the, it's in their hands that they need to really make an effort and try and make sure that this does not escalate any further than it already is at the moment. Dalia, thank you very much for taking time to speak to us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. That was Dalia Abdelamanin in Port Sudan. The outbreak of open fighting in Sudan threatens to further destabilize an already tense region. To get a sense of the wider political dynamics at play, I spoke to Dr. Sharaf Srinivasan, a lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of When Peace Kills Politics, International Intervention and Unending Wars in the Sudans. And I began by asking him, what changed? It's been brewing for a while, but until this April, they'd governed together. So this crisis really emerged in the context of a planned transition to civilian-led rule and to democratic elections down the track as well. And that's been the whole aim of the transition since the deposal of President al-Bashir in, in 2019 was to bring about the transformation in Sudan's politics. Um, now, that, that transition has been really fraught. Uh, there was a coup in October 2021 that both of these two generals and their groups instigated alongside with some other rebel groups. Uh, and then after that coup, it took a long time to get the transition as such back on track with a lot of international mediation. And late last year, they agreed with some civilian forces, the Forces for Freedom and Change, a new plan for the transition. That was late last year. It was called the Framework Agreement. And part of that Framework Agreement set down that during the course of the start of this year, a number of workshops and consultations will be had, and it would lead to a couple of things. One of them was, again, a transition to civilian-led government in the interim. And the second was that as part of the reform of the security sector, there would be only one designated armed force in the country, the Sudan army, and that the rapid support, support forces under Dagalo, otherwise known as Himeti, would be integrated into that force. So there was a sort of ticking clock um, that both sides were aware of that related to their own forces and their position within the hierarchy of the state, but also to this civilian-led transition. And that, both of those uh, um, uh, trajectories were leading them both to be quite vulnerable to what the other was doing and also how it related to the wider political picture. So there was a, a, a breakdown in that transition, some deadlines passed, and it was increasingly clear that both of these generals were getting increasingly suspicious of each other and were starting to position themselves to protect their interests. Uh, whether it was the case that one was moving to be on the offensive quicker than the other is still a bit unclear from what we know, um, but it was a lead up of the breakdown of this transition and the implications it had for them that led to this standoff and now to this uh, crisis and explosion in armed conflict. You've touched on um, the framework agreement. Um, do you think that was problematic and maybe there should have been more civilian voices? It's a really good question. So. On the one hand, ever since President al-Bashir was deposed, what was a popular revolution and a, ra a large uh, assembling and collective action on the streets of Sudan and all, all across the country um, that led to al-Bashir's deposal, it seemed like a, a civilian-led popular uprising. Uh, but it was also a palace coup. And in that sense, the, the, the existing armed and security elites around President al-Bashir are the ones who deposed him. 
So there's always been this uneasy relationship between the military security elites that have retained their grip on the on the state and the promise and prospects of the civilian transition. So indeed, that framework agreement at the end of last year reflected again this unease. Uh, it had still retained these two armed actors as having a primary role in controlling the, the transition process in the state, um, but it was seeking to let in more civilian forces. Whether or not that could have been handled better is, of course, a question that I think many of us are asking. It does seem pretty clear that each time there's been an effort to get these armed military actors back to the negotiating table to agree once again to a transition, Partly what that's doing is reinforcing the status quo, which is that they have a grip on power and on the state. So each time these transition plans have been put together, they haven't necessarily worked to open up the political space to civilian forces or civilian actors. Still talking about civilians, is there any support for either the rapid support forces or the Sudanese armed forces currently now that the conflict is on? And what's the relationship like now between the military and civilians? Yes, so the, the Forces for Freedom and Change, which is the coalition umbrella group of a range of civilian forces, not all you know singing from the same hymn book, uh, there's you know, disagreements amongst them. There's also disagreements between that group and wider civilian forces who have not wanted to be at the negotiating table with these military elites. Um, but that, that group um, has been important in bringing along um, the, uh, the, the situation we see now, which is this ceasefire, which is perilously holding, it's, it lasts um, until um, this evening as we talk today, they have been involved. So they are talking to both sides. They're in, in political engagement with both sides. They haven't taken a position themselves on one side or, or the other. So it's hard to say that the civilian forces are, in a sense, uh, in one camp or, um, or, or seeking to see one of these um, generals prevail over the other. They, they're deeply suspicious of both. Uh, but it is true that the lived experience of many civilian uh, groups, as well as communities in Sudan across the country, the lived experience uh, with respect to these two groups is different. Some have had much more of a horrible time for many years and decades uh, under the coercive um, uh, effects of the armed forces. Uh, others have uh, known very well the rapid support forces in their previous incarnation, uh, which is the armed uh, Arab Janjaweed militias of the early 2000s in Darfur, and so are deeply suspicious of them. Uh, there's also some actors who believe that, in a sense, the armed uh, forces of Sudan is a organ of the of the state. It's the it's the it should be the recognised organ of the state. So they have privileged the armed forces as as being the rightful uh, security actor and are much more suspicious and denigrating of the paramilitary forces. Um, and yet there are others who feel, again, as I said, that the Sudan armed forces historically is a, a instrument of the coercion of the Sudanese state that predates on the regions and on the peripheries in the country. So there's some really big differences amongst the civilian forces and also just Sudanese themselves. So at the moment, much of the violence has been centered around the capital or in the capital, rather Khartoum. Do you see it spilling over across to the rest of the country? I mean, you did mention, you know, what happened in Darfur, where we saw the rapid support forces play a role there in the atrocities. Well, to be truthful, I think a lot of the violence is already uh, very much in Darfur and it has been even leading up to these events of um, the 15th of April and onwards that are especially focused on Khartoum. So the violence has been building in Darfur for a considerable amount of time. It reflects a, a range of inter intersecting dynamics, and it has gotten much worse since the 15th of April. In particular, in West Darfur, in Janaina, there are reports coming out of really grave violations uh, against civilians, uh, raids on civilian you know, households and communities. Uh, there's a much more um, unchecked violence but it hasn't yet really made the mainstream news, I guess, because a lot of the video footage and testimony came from Khartoum in the first instance. So it's been the focus of our attention. And it's also true that the big shock to the Sudanese is that this level and scale of violence has come to the capital, um, Greater Khartoum, including Omdurman and North, uh, North Khartoum, um, because actually for all of the decades of civil war and strife and insecurity in Sudan over, over so long, uh, this level of violence has not, and conflict has never come to the capital for perhaps over a century. Do you expect this to end anytime soon, or are we looking at the beginning of a full-blown civil war? 
We certainly are standing at a precipice. And uh, I say that because there are all of the ingredients of a conflagration into a much larger, complex, multifaceted, multi-actor civil war. Uh, and that would indeed imperil the Sudanese state and, and, and the, the nation. Uh, at the same time, it is true that there's a lot at stake for both of these actors. And, and to the extent that they're carefully calculating their prospects, uh, this pause in the fighting, relative pause, I think there's still quite a lot of incidents of, of armed action by both sides at the moment. But this relative pause uh, may be opening up the, the, the smallest space uh, for a reconsideration by both of them of, of what's in their interests. And that would be because really there's a sort of path of no return for them. They've, they've until now held strong control over this, the state and that has supported both their security interests, but also the military industrial sort of complexes as such that they both sit on top of, which is to say the economies that feed the security sectors in sector in Sudan, um, their hold on gold production, their hold on rents that they extract from um, various industrial bases. Now, all of that is potentially imperiled if the state descends into more uncontrolled conflict. Um, so to the extent that they're also assessing the risks that they face uh, by the, the conflict and violence worsening, one has some cautious hope that um, sense, some sense might prevail in bringing them back from the brink. Okay, now let's talk about Sudan and counterterrorism. It was once a state sponsor for terrorism, but this was abandoned about maybe 10 years ago. Now, we know Sudan has large borders. It was once a major transit um, country for ISIS and Al-Qaeda operatives. Now, in this space where there's a conflict going on, isn't it opening up the space for ter terrorist groups rather to move freely and uh, do as they please? Yes, well, I mean, the, the whole status of Sudan as a state sponsor of terror is uh, a story on itself, right? So um, it links, go, goes back indeed to the 1990s and in the early to mid 1990s, uh, a very expansionist um, Islamist driven uh, state uh, under one of the past incarnations of the, of the rule of President al-Bashir was indeed uh, indulging in a range of forays in the Horn of Africa and elsewhere. Um, was implicated in the attempted assassination on Hosni Mubarak in 1995, uh, gave uh, a ho home to Osama bin Laden in the mid-90s, was implicated in the U.S. embassy bomb bombings um, that occurred um, in East Africa. Um, and it was in that time and around that time that the U.S. Uh, Congress designated Sudan a state sponsor of terror. Um, for many, many years in the 2000s and beyond, the um, Sudan was eager to, to be done with that designation. It took a long time for it to be finally so, and, and that was not um, that long ago. Um, but it is true that it has that history and that there is a good memory of that. Um, and it is also true that around the figure of uh, Burhan, um, the, the general in charge of the army and the head of state as such, um, is some of the uh, former Islamist influences um, under President al-Bashir. There, you know, there is a connection there. Um, so that's, that's the context and the history. I, I think the bigger concern really isn't from necessarily as such Sudan's past and within Sudan, but rather how Sudan relates to the uh, very restless and um, politically unstable and insecure Sahel region. So all the way from Mali um, through Chad to Darfur and Sudan and, and the implications of a, a weaker Sudanese state with less control over its security, with more security actors operating within its borders and fluid you know, and porous borders um, um, to other countries, that that might indeed um, lead to uh, more of a risk and more of a threat um, of, uh, of, of you know, uh, various types of militias, um, potentially also groups that would be designated um, as terrorist actors in, in the region. Um, and that also, you know, by the way, as well, relates to Libya, um, you know, the, the sorts of connections between Libya and uh, into Darfur and in the east also to the um, fraught relations with, uh, with Eritrea as well. Okay. Now, still looking at the broader theme of external players, both sides have support from regional and global powers. Who exactly supports whom and to what end? Yes, well, I mean, it's obviously uh, 
hard to to establish the hard and cold facts mm. on on what that support is but let me outline just some some very obvious relationships and the extent to which that support is ongoing to the extent to which it's actually military in nature uh, these are all questions that i think need careful careful consideration uh, but egypt has the a strong historic link that has been revived over recent years with the Sudan armed forces um, under uh, uh, Sisi um, as the as the leader in Egypt, uh, the desire for a strong, uh, possibly military authoritarian state that's stable and secure uh, in its hinterland is pretty clear. So I think it's, it, there's a you know, there's a very clear relationship there between Egypt and the Sudan armed forces. Um, the rapid support forces themselves have a, a range of different relationships that are built up over the years. Uh, one of those relationships uh, has, and more immediately of concern, has been with General Haftar in Libya. And so that's a relationship that has um, warmed uh, over over some time and, and certainly relates to mutual interests, um, security interests, as well as sort of political economy interests, you could say. Um, but then there's a separate relationship that is in some senses via General Haftar, because one of Haftar's patrons is the United Arab Emirates. And the United Arab Emirates also has a pretty established uh, uh, relationship with the rapid support forces. That relationship in part turns on um, the gold production that is part of the core economy that keeps the rapid support forces um, uh, you know, uh, uh, solvent um, and is a really a source of um, considerable bounty for, for that force. Uh, but it also relates to the uh, Saudi-led coalition and war in Yemen, in which the rapid support forces were in large numbers, uh, foot soldiers in that conflict, uh, but under Emirati patronage, so the UAE providing the, the funding and to some extent the resources, including military resources, for the rapid support forces to be um, uh, deployed in Yemen. Um, so those relationships go back quite far. And um, they're, the, they're, I think, some of the key actors involved here. Um, there's, this, there's established relationships between Saudi Arabia and the Sudan armed forces, and to some extent the RSF, uh, but there's no clear, I think, privileging of one over the other. Probably, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, there is a privileging of the Sudan armed forces, but it's not a black and white um, case. Um, and then there are other relationships in the region. So Chad is a, is always implicated in any of the conflict and violence in, in Darfur because it's a long border that it shares with Darfur and the conflicts and violence spill over from one side to the other quite regularly. So it's now implicated in, in this conflict and, 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 and surely anxious about what the um, effect would be of an increase in militarization in Darfur within its borders. Um, South Sudan has a strategic interest in the oil pipeline that flows from its oil fields through to Port Sudan, which is the only way that it gets its oil out to market and on which the state is, is vitally dependent on, on those oil revenues. So it's pretty anxious about what's happening in Sudan. Um, that's not to say it has sort of, I guess, a uh, preference one way or the other with these groups, but one would assume that it probably still has a, a, a um, has, has had more relationship with and a need to relate to the Sudan armed forces in the last decade. Um, so, yeah, these are just some of the, the key relationships in the immediate region. Um, and then, of course, there are some others beyond that. OK, so you've listed quite a number. It seems very complicated. And um, just to explain to us. How do these relationships um, complicate the conflict? Because each country comes in with its own geostrategic interests. Yes, it's, it's exactly that. There are a range of geostrategic interests, um, as well as just lit, you know, bilateral interests, security interests, economic interests um, that are uh, in part of the geostrategic interests. But the, the geostrategic interest relates to something else again, which is that Sudan really is, a, you know, it straddles a whole set of rest of regions, the Horn of Africa, North Africa and the Sahel, um, the Arab world. And so it, it straddles all of them. It has it has an, a relationship to all of them. And in the context of geostrategic competition in the Indian Ocean world, as well as in North Africa, um, uh, Sudan features for its specific bilateral interests, but also because it's uh, part of that 
larger and greater game. Um, and that, that in turn you know, brings into play um, a set of more international interests that are concerned about what's happening in, in these parts of the world, whether that be the United States or Russia, um, just to name um, two important ones. Um, so in this context, what's worrying is that the, um, the impact of any one of these actors in getting a bit further involved in the conflict is to draw, is to draw others in. Um, now, at this at this point, it's not clear at all that that is playing out actively. Um, certainly, in the lead up to this conflict, um, some of these countries were more actively engaged. Um, Egypt and and um, Haftar and Libya, uh, especially. But there's no clear evidence that they have sustained an active sort of military involvement since this ex- this whole situation exploded. Um, but that is the risk. That is the risk is that at a certain point, it's not enough to get the actors on the ground, the Sudan Armed Forces and the RSF to the table, because there are others with influence that are shaping their their actions um, in some way or another as well. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question, that the Western diplomats and others, they've left Khartoum. So um, who, in your opinion, can play a mediating role and convince the generals to stop uh, fighting? You've given me a long list of uh, people who are interested, um, possible mediators. What about the Russians and the Chinese? Do you think they could play a mediating role? It's not clear that they would be high on the list. I mean, they certainly have a, a role to play, but they have, don't have a track record of mediating in Sudan's conflicts. Um, the Chinese a little bit more so uh, in the context of the the long civil war uh, with um, with the SPLM and SPLA in southern Sudan. Um, the, the Chinese did get progressively a little bit more involved over time um, with that. But I, I, I wouldn't say that they're... Uh, eager to get involved. They're not showing any signs of that now. Um, And while I guess Western diplomats, um, many of whom have left the country, um, uh, might seem less engaged in that literal immediate sense, um, I think the the lines of communication um, probably are most active between countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia and these generals plus the United Nations um, who were involved heavily in this transition and the framework agreement and the Western diplomats that sat around that process. Um, now, no, none of them necessarily have the sufficient leverage, but they would be, I think, probably the primary actors that could, um, to, they, they could they come to um, bring their influence to bear. I think one way of thinking about this is especially to take the regional actors, um, especially Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and think about what influence can be brought to bear on them by Western and other wider international actors. Um, and by doing that to ensure that they um, don't, uh, you know, fuel, fuel further the fire that is, is occurring. And also that they take, if they can actually reconcile more effectively their own positions, that that might lead to a space opening up that compels the, um, the, Sudan, the Sudan Armed Forces and the RSF um, to to a more negotiating position. So I think it might be a, a set of concentric circles as such that means that some influence and leverage can be can be used. What about African solutions for African problems? Does the African Union have no clout in dealing with this conflict? Well, I think one organization that does matter and, and matters right now is the Regional uh, Intergovernmental Authority for Development, um, EGAD, uh, which is a regional organization of East Africa and Horn of Africa countries. And it's quite clear that um, after the first 72-hour ceasefire was brokered, it seems primarily under U.S. influence. Um, it's not exactly clear how that how that was done. Um, but since then, the, the focus has shifted to EGA trying to sustain this ceasefire beyond um, midnight tonight as we speak. So I think... Uh, EGAD is, is, is centrally important and, and has been centrally important to that to that idea of African solutions to African problems. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, the African Union has been less visible and prominent so far, but certainly has a role to play. But I also think it's a bit unfair to, to just uh, uh, herald this idea of African solutions to African problems when the pro- problem is in itself just purely African. When you've got the UAE and Saudi Arabia involved um, in, in one way or another, um, potentially other actors with influence, um, it, it takes uh, 
a, a range of actors to to actually coordinate their affairs and um, come up with a coherent position to be able to come in and effectively mediate or at least open a space for mediation um, for the actors on the ground. Okay, so um, in your opinion, what needs to be done to end the conflict? For example, what about if international players froze bank accounts abroad? Would this change the dynamics? We have, after all, heard about um, General Dagalo's vast wealth through gold trading. Um, so are sanctions a potential way forward? I think that this, the use of sanctions is helpful when you know uh, what your um, uh, expectation is of the, the preferred um, course of action and behavior. And so I think what would matter more is that the, the way forward towards a political resolution and a political outcome that um, that matters is um, is articulated and identified that brings the parties uh, in a sense to the table to um, ensure that they don't uh, inhibit um, uh, a, a, a political resolution and at that point then you know, there, there can be the use of a such what's you know, what's known as sticks as opposed to carrots but sticks can be helpful to ensure that they stick to those commitments but I think just applying sanctions right now um, is not necessarily relevant to their calculations and decisions, nor is it particularly uh, constructive in getting them to move towards a more political as opposed to military posture. So my own view is that that's not really going to be effective nor necessarily useful at this point in time. Um, but rather what's going to matter is um, ensuring that, um, that there's a pathway for them to uh, agree to a political space opening up and that from there that they can make certain commitments about be being much less involved in in the in, in politics in the sense that they have to be able to sort of step back into and to move towards a um, you know occupying a security position in, in the state and not a, a political one so I think that's it's quite messy I think the more useful thing could be to focus on um, these other regional actors and how they can play a role in exerting influence. So in particular, when we talked about the gold um, production and exports and that, that source of revenue. Um, so in what ways can the UAE take a position that encourages the RSF to pull back from further confrontation? Um, I think that's a more useful and productive question to answer than just the application of sanctions as such. So do you think there's a resolution of some kind likely at this point, or is a further deterioration likely to be inevitable? I think that it's very hard to be inside the heads of the warring generals and what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have a tremendous sense of their coercive capacity and their right to rule. Those bode badly because I think now they have faced off uh, in a in a form that makes it quite hard for one to to retreat without the other taking advantage, and so that puts the whole thing in a perilous situation. Uh, however, if I if in the cold light of day they were to look at their interests, they might be seeing that so much of what they have is now at stake, including their grip on sources of economic rents, etc., because. Um, they are undermining the capacity to sustain those rents if the conflict gets worse. Um, so might they settle for something less than outright victory that still preserves their interests and gives them a, a as, as what's called in the in the parlance an off ramp? Um, this is the juncture at which that seems still just about possible because of the ceasefire, because of the calming of the initial um, period, ten days of of, of violence. Um, this is a juncture where they could step back from the brink, um, but it's going to take a lot for them to to do that. Um, if if this is not taken, and if they if the conflict is worsens from here, the, the risk is that a number of other actors um, get drawn in. That the violence takes slightly different forms. It's not just a pure confrontation between these two groups. In places like West Darfur, it's already clear that a 
number of militias on the ground connected to more local sources of authority and power are also um, being drawn into the conflict and the violence because of concerns of security, etc. on a local level. Um, it becomes more worrying about how some of the other actors in the region um, start to sort of manipulate and uh, instrumentalize the conflict towards their interests. Um, we can worry about how some of the rebel movements that exist already within Sudan start to either um, be drawn in or see the situation more opportunistically because both of these um, armed groups are now sort of in a sense degrading each other's capabilities. So I think all of those sorts of risks um, and potential scenarios lie ahead if this is to drag on much further. Um, and that is a, a tremendous worry. Um, but we are at a moment just now where there is a, a sliver of hope that um, some of that could really be avoided. Uh, but it's going to take a tremendous shift in the momentum and position of these two actors to to get to their to get to a, a resolution of sorts. Sharath, thank you very much for your insight. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. This has been The Lead, a podcast by New Lines magazine. Thank you again to our guests. You can find Delia on Twitter at Delia SD and Sharath at Sharath underscore SRI. You can also buy Sharath's latest book, When Peace Kills Politics, International Intervention and Unending Wars in the Sudans in all good bookshops. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Kwangu Liwewe. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you all for joining us.